All right. Hello, 14 us brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is November 23rd, 2023. Happy Thanksgiving to all of our American brothers and sisters. I'm Canadian, so it was back in October for us. But for all of our uh, American brothers and sisters, happy Thanksgiving. Hope you're enjoying it, uh, taking some time off, relaxing, but also, hey, spending a little time with the Lord. It doesn't matter what day it lands for me. We will always be putting these videos out. And tonight was the next day. So hopefully this will find some people rested and relaxed and energized and ready to dig into some more meat in the revelation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his word, because it's so incredible, guys. Tonight, we're going to go into the 153 fish, and you're going to notice something that's pretty wild. The, the further I went into it, the more I spent some time and I was digging in, and I'm going to share some video clips with you a little as we get into it. And these video clips were parts that I had never heard before of what people also claim uh, and scholars. I think it was even like Oxford or whatever it was, but you'll hear in, in one of the clips of, of what they think the 153 has a connection to. And it's awesome. You know, we're going to touch again on the 14ers just because of a little of a little thing that popped up in relation to the Nazarenes, the watchmen, right? The the original 14ers, they were Nazarenes, they were watchmen. And so that's why Christ never spoke against them. He was one as well, right? So we're we're going to touch on that just a little bit because of a, a video that was shared with me. But the connection to it is why I'm sharing it. Because what you're going to notice as I went through this and was putting this together and was studying it, I found all of these connections being like a full circle, like just doing a, a whole 360. It starts at the beginning, and where it ends is kind of the beginning. You see, we've talked about this before, and we're going to talk about it tonight as we get there in relation to being right now in the age of Laodicea. We're in the Laodicean age, and, and it's it's not funny, but if people spent a little bit more time studying the word, they would realize that, hey, if we're in the Laodicean age, and there's a was, is, and is to come, we know that there's going to be the seven churches replaying. And we've taught that. We've actually revealed how the seven churches relate and play out in the end of days. And so we know here that we're in the Laodicea. We've talked how there's a there's some nuggets within Laodicea, which isn't speaking to the whole of everybody, but to a group of watchmen who we know he's going to foretell within moments. I don't know how soon, but they're part of those who are going to sup with him and he's going to sit down and serve them. But guess what? Do you know that this also happens at the end? So you're going to see this full circle of how we're at the end, coming out to the very end before the end of days next year, I believe, and we're in the Laodicean age. And then the seven churches will start over again, and when it's over, it's the Laodicean age. Well, you know what's fantastic about it? It was the same thing when Christ was here. <clears throat> there was a an is from the beginning of creation until Christ came. There was this typology of seven churches that played out. And we've shared this before, and it's in the Ministry Revealed book. You have the, the was of Old Testament typology. You have the is of what we're in right now, and we're Laodicea. And then you've got the is to come. And we've shared on these things before, but you're going to see how it lines up and, and how it, it replays and touches on these things. And when Christ was here the first time, this wording from Christ's death and then his resurrection. So think of like from his death and resurrection and then seven days, and then he comes back on the eighth and he starts his 40 days. Well, there was an exact prophetic picture of that as the end of a Laodicean age at that time and the new age starting, which was salvation in Christ and the Holy Ghost, right? That came at 50 days later. So it's going to replay and when you see it here, it all comes because of the revelation of 153 fish. Can you believe that? 
I didn't know it. <laughs> I had no idea. I know where the 153 relates to. I know it's prophetically for the end of days, for the end of tribulation. But I wanted to be able to find connections and, and see how and where this played out and, and what made it so. Well, you're going to see what was into the is and what is into the is to come. And for anybody that doesn't understand it, the was is creation till Christ. The is, uh, the is is from Christ until the pre-trib, and the is to come is from the pre-trib to the end. All right? So with that, it's it's going to be awesome. And, and then we'll even see some a couple little pieces you might catch along the way. And in the next video, I want to tie in more revelation to the last video that I did. So the Beast of Revelation... I mean, you want to talk about being fired up, man. It was so awesome to be able to understand and to be able to reveal this understanding from Revelation to Daniel that we have never understood before. We can understand that time frame of the beast. We know where the beast comes from. We know we know those who are with them. And it, it, it was incredible. But there's a lot more still to come from it. And one of the things that I was asked, and I know many people want to know, is in relation to Babylon, right? Mystery Babylon. Does does Babylon get destroyed in the beginning, in the middle, at the end? Well, you might even catch a little nugget, and I might even pause on it if I remember when I get to it. But in the next video, I'm going to go back into this Revelation to Daniel connection and bring more clarity to the book of Revelation, especially those chapters, right? Like, like uh, from 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, in that and, and that conversation taking place. But you're going to see a little glimpse of it in this one today. Just a little glimpse. So hold on to your horses for that one because it's going to be awesome. And guys, I have to put it out there um, because the ministry is in need. We're down to like a handful of dollars in the account. And it's been brutal for the last uh, about four months or so. And so, you know, I pray about it and I ask the Lord, I'm always, you know, in all sorts of things, but I also bring this one up to the Lord, you know, Lord, why, you know, why does it have to be so difficult at this point to be able to, to, to keep getting it out there to the world and, and to get the support that we need. And, you know, I keep thinking, I know the Lord provides, it's been six years and the Lord always provides. And there are great people who do support the ministry and a large number who are praying for the ministry and for each other. And that's that's all we can ask. The only thing is, it's like point zero 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 seven percent, less than that, point zero 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 seven, I think, percent of all people that give on a monthly basis. It's it's not many at all. And then there's a few along the way. And we are grateful for because without you this wouldn't be happening. And so I know that the Lord provides and I'm always praying to the Lord, you know, I know you always provide Lord. It's been six years. I know you'll keep providing. And you know, then it dawns on me. Well, I know you provide Lord. So, I mean, I'm not going to win a lottery ticket or anything. I don't play the lottery. This is what I'm called to do. This is my job. So I know that you're going to provide. And the thought always comes, well, who does he use to provide? He uses brothers and sisters, right? So I know not everybody can provide. But for those who can, those who have thought about it, it would be appreciated. Those uh, who can't, we always pray for each other, right? And for those who already are, thank you so very much. You can come right here. It's Our PayPal is here. Our GoFundMe is here. And you can do it just by clicking on this. You can find the links in the under the videos, or you can go to the Ministry Revealed website as well. So with that, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, it hasn't been like this in probably four years. It's it's that it's that uh, it's that tight. Everything's getting pushed. Uh, you know, credit on this and that. I mean, it's terrible. And so hopefully we can alleviate some of that with your support. So with that, for anybody that's new, I'm going to do my best not to spend too much time right here, as I tend to go off a little bit long on it. But if you're new to the ministry, or you or you uh, are relatively new. You've been around even for a little bit, but you haven't yet come to watch this intro series. It's a must. The, the only way to understand how all of these things have opened to the revelation of the end of days as they have never been revealed in all of history, you have to first understand what started it. 
And you can come to this playlist here and watch the first four videos. The other thing you can do is you can go to ministryrevealed.com. Here's our website. This is the homepage. See, we have uh, PayPal and GoFundMe just right here on these links as well. Donating to the mission. That's also for uh, Uganda as well, as well as the ministry here. And you can also go to the menu and click on the intro. And I recommend, I mean, if you're on YouTube, just watch it on YouTube. But if you want to easily understand which ones to watch, this is a 22-minute intro of what the next three videos are going to touch on. This is the first one, the 30-minute intro of who the Gospels are speaking to. And you're going to understand for the first time in your life why there are differences in the Gospels. Like the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're going to see in the end of days, it's Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And that the differences in all of their differences within the Gospels are prophecy. They cannot just be set aside to say, well, it was just perspective. It doesn't work. You can't say that Luke says about an eighth day at the uh, Mount Transfiguration. Mark and Matthew both say after six days. Something is going on. And the answer is prophetic. And we will prove it to you. This is just a 30-minute intro, uh, intro video Bible study that will begin to reveal it. Once you understand that and you realize that the Gospels are speaking to different groups, you're going to realize the discourses are too. You're going to see that the truth of the end of days is a period we call 14 years. It's the revelation of 14 years, which is why I started calling us 14ers. I just, I just did. It wasn't because of anything else, but because of the revelation that happened in about October, November of 2017 and realizing that it was two sets of seven. And Luke's related to a portion called above, which is 50 days that starts with the pre-trip. This will begin to give you the understanding in a 30-minute Bible study on it. And then this one is the big one. This one's about two hours, 45 minutes. And the answer as to why it was never understood is, one, it just wasn't the timing. God's time wasn't yet to reveal it. And in the past six years, it has been. But it goes much deeper than that. And the answer is because we have all been taught from the foundation of Matthew's gospel, not realizing who Mark and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels were speaking to, even though they knew the gospel of Matthew was to Judah, they didn't quite fully understand Mark and Luke's, and those who had a bit of an idea never understood what it meant. And those differences in who they're speaking to is the entirety of the revelation that will open up to you the entire Bible, the entire Bible, all the way back to revealing the creations. Yeah, you heard that right if you're new, the creations. It'll blow your mind. But that's not where you start. You must start with these first four videos to really grasp it. Then you can go deeper. And this is like a three-hour Bible study on the differences in the Gospels. This is the, the discourses revealed in order for the end of days, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You'll see pre, mid, and post revealed in typologies of the triumphal entry, transfiguration, resurrection, and on and on and on. The seven churches revealed in their understanding for the end of days. That was a mystery that pastors and prophecy teachers have been seeking for centuries. It's revealed here in this ministry. So hold on. <laughs> get ready because it is truly going to blow your mind. Go into it with prayer. Seek out the revelation, follow it along, study it yourself as you go through, and you will see for yourself that everything spoken about is all scripture, all backed by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scriptures, proving it all to be true. All right. So now with that, I wanted to start with this with you guys. What am I look forward to? At the end? I'm going to. I have it on a little bit faster because there's like four minutes worth. But I want to play this for you guys because uh, it was shared with us in the forum on Ministry Revealed. So, again, if you hear me talking about the forum, anybody who would like to join the forum, you can come to the website right here. Click on forum. All right. It takes you a few seconds to sign up. Doesn't cost anything. There's 1,200 people around the world in there. And we're sharing on all sorts of things, Bible studies, events, uh, news, all sorts of stuff going on in there. All right. So you can come and uh, join us there as well. But let, let me play this video, just a little encouraging video, but almost like a, like a let's remind ourselves of this, right? That this life that we have right now is so short. It's just poof. It's a vapor. And we can get caught in that vapor, right? 
but we need to remind ourselves, and I think this is a good reminder from uh, Francis Chan, just how short it is. Let's have a listen. What's going on, man? What am I look forward to? At the end? I'm going to bring an illustration that this is like the first illustration I did. It was 20 years ago, but I can't think of a better way to to explain it. Um, I actually didn't use a rope back then. I used a remember a, remember computer paper when uh, it was all stuck together and it had the holes on the side that you had to peel off. Remember that? I remember getting a, a roll. Some of you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, which is crazy to me. But because uh, I was the best, you know, and um, and it never worked right because of the rolling things. But uh, but I, I had I remember being a youth pastor and I put uh, that computer paper all the way around the room and. Uh, but I'm gonna use a rope now because I can't find that computer paper. Um, imagine this rope, okay, pretend this rope just goes on forever, okay? Just imagination, pretend it goes around the world a few times, it doesn't, it ends at the rock. But uh, let's just imagine this thing goes on forever. Now imagine that this rope is a timeline of your existence. You just exist forever. You see this red part? This would represent your time on Earth. You've got a few short years here on Earth and then you've got all of eternity somewhere else. This is, this is your existence. And what blows me away is some of you, all you think about is this red part. It's all you think about, you're consumed with this. You go, oh man, I can't wait till here. You know, I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna save, 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 so I can really enjoy this part right here. <laughs> and you're consumed with that. And you're thinking, oh man, I'm gonna get to travel. Am I gonna eat well? Am I gonna do this during this part? And I'm like, are you kidding me? What about this? What about this? What about, what about all this stuff? It's, just, it's crazy to me because the Bible teaches that what I do during this little red part determines how I'm going to exist for millions and millions and millions of years forever. And, and so why would I spend this little red part trying to make myself as comfortable as possible, enjoying myself as much as I can? Paul says, look, I'm going to live my life for this mission. I'm going to spend my life, invest my life for this moment when I cross that finish line. See, I'm going to forget about all this stuff I could enjoy, and I'm not going to look around. I'm going to be like a runner just looking at that moment when I face God, because when I face him, then I don't get this chance over again. We get one chance at this life on earth, and it can end at any second for any of us. We've got one chance at this, and then comes eternity. And I'm not going to be fooled. I'm not going to spend my life down here. See, people look at some of my decisions and go, oh, you're so stupid, because that's going to really affect this. I go, no, you're stupid, because that's going to affect all of this. Man, I, I, I'm serious. I, I look. So I wanted to share that with you. I thought that was great, right? It, all this time focused on this. No, no, we have to remember what comes next. And I think uh, overall in this ministry and the brothers and sisters around the world here, we, we're well aware of it, right? We're, we're studying prophecy. It's the revelation of the word is prophecy being revealed. So we're definitely aware of the is to come. But did you see uh, or hear what he said there as well? That this determines your place in this. It determines what happens after this life? It determines where your position is going to be. That's pretty wild, right? I don't know how many times you may have thought of that, but not something I ponder very often. But what we do here with this life, knowing what we know, is, is going to determine where our position is going to be. A lot of people forget about that. A lot, of, a lot of Christians don't even consider that. They just think, oh, we all go to heaven and it'll be, uh, I don't know, cake and eating and violins or something floating on clouds it's eternity guys and what we do here determines our place there wild all right now let me show you this little clip this is from um oh yeah this was <laughs> our brother uh, uh clive sends me a lot of good videos and he lets me know where to watch within videos too because you know if somebody sends me an hour-long video or two i'm you you have to let me know where to watch right i'm studying and doing all sorts of things that it's it's not to to watch all of those videos through unless it's of course the study of the revelation right so he sends me clips and where to watch and uh the reasons why so it's pretty awesome um but here's one right here. We've talked about the Shroud of Turn before, and uh, we've understood it. We, I believe it absolutely. I, I've seen enough evidence um, from, from things that haven't even been understood yet, like the pendant Jesus was wearing, which represented Taurus. Um, it's awesome. But here's another one. Let's have a listen. Yes. The most substantial revelation pertaining to the Shroud has emerged from a Paris-based organization, the International Center of Studies on the Shroud of Turin. Concealed within the fabric, researchers from this institution have unveiled astonishing findings, inscriptions that defy easy explanation. It can be observed that beneath and to the sides of the chin, there are three distinct and evenly spaced lines where no image appears. These scientists carefully broke down the official shroud photos into many small squares, gave each square a level of brightness, and then used a program to analyze them visually. As a result, a set of letters gradually emerged, written in both Latin and Greek. These inscriptions reference Jesus, and one side bears the word Nazarene. 
The prevailing theory suggests that the text was inscribed on a separate document by a scribe and then affixed to the shroud over the face, a practice intended to aid relatives in the proper identification and burial of the deceased. The composition of the ink employed during that period could have facilitated the transfer of the writing onto the linen. Importantly, this inscription procedure did not interfere with the technique used to generate the image on the shroud. And for those that don't know what I'm talking about, when I talk about this the This inscription pendant, procedure did not interfere with the technique used to generate the image. This is the, this was a, a necklace and there's a pendant on it right here. It's pretty awesome. We got a video on it too. Image on the shroud. According to researchers, this discovery effectively rules out the chance of the text originating from medieval times. They argue that even during that era, no Christian. Not even a forger would have referenced Jesus without recognizing his divine nature. Failing to do so would have carried the peril of being labeled a heretic. The improved images of the excerpted words have also been shared with other specialists, and they agreed that the writing style was consistent with the typical script from the Middle East during the first century, which corresponds to the time of Jesus. This unquestionably verifies that the person imprinted on the shroud is indeed none other than Jesus, who selflessly gave his life for our salvation. And who was it? Jesus of Nazareth, of course, right? The Nazarene. We all know Jesus was from Nazareth. We know that he was a Nazarene. And this is why when we see that he never spoke anything against the, the, um, the Essenes, they were Nazarenes as well. You see, and this is what we've shared in the past. So it's just a little reminder with this little clip of this that we know the original Christians, those who were ready and watching, who were the watchmen ready, watching for him when he was coming from the end of the was into the time of the is when he would show up. They were the ones who were the Nazarenes. Jesus then comes from Nazareth. And who do these people become? The 14ers. You see, it doesn't this kind of stuff, guys, it just blows my mind. The original Christians were not called Christians. They were Nazarenes, or Nastrum is singular, who were called 14ers, and it was the Romans or the church that was calling them by this name as if it was a bad thing. It, it, this kind of stuff, guys, <laughs> when you realize what's happening here, when you realize how the name came about just because of the revelation, when you realize there was a group before Christ, and then when Christ shows up, he's connected to them, when you realize that there's what? Sons of God, co-heirs with Christ, who will reign with Christ, who will sit with them at his table. It gets bananas. It, it gets outrageous to even ponder. Am I saying with absolute certainty that, that people here are that group with them? No, but I'm showing you the points within it that are just so astronomically unbelievable that there's just no other way to really explain it. Here's, here's in relation to the Nazarenes. And we know that they mean their name means watchman. Okay. So it talks about original followers. So the original followers of Yeshua are known as the Nastrum, which is plural from Nastari, uh, because you'll see sect of the Nazarenes. So what are they? They're a sect of the watchmen. Okay, we see this just as it says in Acts 24, verse 5. It even says when Paul's talking, a sect of the Nazarenes. So listen to what it says here. It says, um, and we think it right to hear from you what you think, for indeed, concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So a group of people in Christ being spoken about everywhere, and they're called a sect, and this sect, they were who? The Nazarene. Like Christ. The ones who were what? Willing to put their necks on the line? Like, like a group that was prepared as watchmen when he came? <laughs> it's crazy. The definition of sect is the same word as cult, and a cult is not necessarily a bad thing at all. It's only a label flung about to judge a group before thoroughly examining their teachings. The Nazarene were, origin were the original followers of Yeshua long before Roman Catholicism and Christianity 
even existed. That's what we've been talking about. That's what this keeps telling us, right? This group of pre-people. Now, there are those that will go pre, and there are those that will remain with them. It's not just the workers that are the sons of God, but there's a group of workers from among the sons of God who remain to what? Endure as he endured. That's only one group. That's the pre-trib worker group. And you see them in the term for Nazareth and, and, Naz, and, and Nest, Nestor and Nestor and where the wording comes from. Well, what about this group? We know this group very well. Right? Was it a uh, First Peter? Was that what it was? Right? First Peter. Oh yeah, let me show you this one. I think it was First Peter three. No, First Peter one. Listen to this. Remember, we've shared on this. Remember when we first came across this? I don't know, maybe about a year or so ago. I want to remind you of this part. In First Peter one one. It says, Peter, an, apostle, uh, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers. Okay, listen to this. A resident foreigner. They're not Jews. You see, a lot of the original ones watching for Christ were Jews. And strangers would come and join in, right? Which means the Gentiles. Well, now it turned from the time of the Jews during the is, and the focus is on the Gentiles. So who would be a group as a pre-group watchman group that's ready before Christ, watching for his return and prepared and ready, who are a group of Nazarenes that are strangers who are a part of his elect from the foreknowledge of God? The same ones who are the sons of God that we've talked about before. You're going to understand as we keep going why I'm tying this in in relation to the 153, it's directly connected, as you're going to see, to the sons of God. But some people dismiss it because they haven't understood it. But when you know what we've revealed, it's not hard. You see, so this group of strangers who are Gentiles, elect according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood. Uh, of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. What do we know about this group? In 1 Peter 1, 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the time of Christ? No, in the end of days. How many times do we see scripture literally talking about at the time of the end, in the end of years? And yet people have taken it and, and tried to associate it to things from 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago. No, it's about the end of days. So who's this group kept? Watchers that are chosen to be watchers in advance? Right? It's awesome. Watchers chosen in advance, who we know from Romans 8, are the ones who are spirit-filled, who have the spirit of God, who are the sons of God. Which will be everybody going pre-trib, but a group from among them are kept by the power of God, who, is, who are the remnant workers for seals that will be with them for the 40 days and remain during seals. Verse 6, wherein... You greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through the manyfold temptations. Amen, right? While we're trying to live in the flesh, yet be in the spirit. Live by the spirit and not by the flesh. We still have to deal with things that are in the flesh, right? And the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, Though it be tried with fire. I want you to remember that. Though it be tried with fire. So a group in this time when it goes from just like it did with them, it went from the was to the is, and they were that group. There's a group from Gentiles who are in the is, who will be prepared as watchmen when the is to come starts. Whose, whose faith 
is better the trial of their faith more precious than gold that perishes being tried by fire <laughs> verse 8 whom not seen whom having not seen you love in whom though you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable full of glory right every one of us receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls again we've spoken about this there's only one way to receive the end of your faith and that's if you're in the presence of your faith um of which salvations the prophets have inquired and searched diligently seeing what manner or manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify beforehand this guys you could say some of this is happening to watchmen throughout the generations, but this is a specific group of watchmen. I'm not only saying us, but I believe in portion of us who are being kept for the end, who are watchmen kept, prepared through the trial of their faith, more precious than gold being tried that perishes, right? Well, I want you to remember that because, again, this is going to be something that directly connects into all of these things that we're talking about. And yes, even the 153 fish. It's, it's pretty incredible to see, as I told you, this full circle that takes place. Seven churches play out, full circle. Seven churches play out, full circle. Seven churches play out. That's what you're going to see. So. Let me go now. This, for anybody that's new to the ministry, um, this is our chapters to years. This is our most updated chart because until the pre-trib happens and the 14 years then begin, we're gonna, we can adjust it. Some people would say, oh, how can you adjust it? You said it was that year, the year before, the year before. Because we're not only, we're not seeking the when, but it is part of the ministry. It is part of understanding the season and times of the end of days. But the real mystery has always been where this first 70 years is observed. And so we've explained it. We've gone through a lot of these things. And so this can continue to be moved as long as the tribulation and nothing happens. It'll move year by year by year. So all you have to do is if you had this in the book or you had an old one, you can actually download this from the description box below from the ministry revealed website or if you have it in the book you can just white it out and put these other year counts over it because it doesn't matter what the year is what counts is when it begins because when it begins all of these chapters and the the evidence of events within them play out in the course of the above which is 50 days and then the 14 years it's absolutely phenomenal and let me show you some of those examples. We've showed how, well, let me show it right here. We've showed how Ezekiel, for example, chapter 47, is the 14th year of tribulation. It's the seventh year of trumpets. Well, we know that it's seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, but at the end of the 13th, the very end of the 13th, Lord returns feet down, right? Starts the 14th year. And what do we know about it? We know it's Matthew 24, days of Noah. We know there's a typology, as we've shared many times, within the days of Noah that gives us, that gives us the, the above count from seven and then says, and seven more days, meaning years. And then it talks about the olive branch plucked off, which is the great multitude rapture picture. And then it says, yet seven other days. And when it does, it's a picture of the end of tribulation. So we know that the big picture, but we also know that there's a picture in Genesis chapter 7 to 8 in the story of Noah that is a picture of the final 14th year, which is why Matthew chapter 24, right, which is why Matthew chapter 24 is the only discourse when you realize that the discourses go Luke, Mark, and Matthew Luke's is pre-trib, and there's that 40, 50-day portion, and then it goes the 14 years, and it's the seven years of Mark's discourse, seven years of trumpets for Matthew's discourse, and 
what happens? Well, the Lord comes after six. That's why we see immediately after the tribulation of those days. And it'll be the day and hour no one knows. And we know that that final year plays out as the days of Noah. This is going to be very significant to understand that we know that the story of Noah in the final year, which is Noah's as one year and 10 days, remember, is the only time that could happen, which is in a Shemitah year cycle in the 49th year, because there were seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, and then seven, quote unquote, easy, where the bride is being prepared, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. This is essentially the 49th year. And only in the 49th year is it a year and 10 days long because it goes to the sounding of the trumpet at atonement, which is the proclamation of the Jubilee. When they will all receive their land, they will all have their portion and be brought back exactly like Zechariah 48 says. But something happens in Zechariah 47 first. But what is it also? It's also as it was in the days of Noah, that final year as Noah's. Well, in John, in his gospel that has 21 chapters and reveals the pre-mid-post connection, just like we always share, you know, uh, chapter 14, we see that he said he would go and prepare a place for them. And when he returns, he'll receive them unto himself. Well, it just so happens that's the seventh year where the great multitude rapture is the mid-trib in the seventh year of seals. And what did he do? He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion to receive them unto himself to the place where he's prepared. We know that that he's here for three and a half years of trumpets, and then Satan's cast down, the pit is opened, and he's gone, and we see a cutting off that's about to happen with Yeshua. Here he talks about the vine because it's the 144,000 and those that need to produce fruit. And, of course, right here in chapter 20, it's him in another way we're not going to get into when, he, when he's going to return feet down. And what we have to understand within all of these is... The prophetic picture within events in these chapters to years, sometimes, I haven't talked about this in a little while, but it could be an event that happens at the beginning of that year. It could happen maybe closer to the middle of that year, or it could be an event that happens towards the very end of that year. But it's going to happen within that year of going Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets. It's going to happen within that year. And some discernment will tell you it's earlier on, some will tell you it's more mid, and some will tell you those events are probably later in that year, okay? And that's what you see with John chapter 20. And then you go to John chapter 21, and what do we know about John chapter 21? Well, it's the 14th year of tribulation. We know the Lord has returned. And in that, we have a conversation of the 153 fish. But we also have some other very exciting wording around it. And what was John chapter 20 into 21 in the is after the death and resurrection of Christ? It was the beginning of his 40 days. Hello. It was right. It was kind of like the, the setup that started everything for the is that was about to take place. You see? And where are we now? So it, it, it's like it's like they were at that end of the Laodicean age. And at the Holy Ghost, it was going to start all over again. Right? There's this, this overlap, one ending and another starting. This typology of that type of thing taking place. Because, well, that's exactly what we know. It's the story of his resurrection. And then this event taking place with them. Right, those things were were quick and together when they took place. So, here we are starting at the end of tribulation, but it's also a prophetic picture of the beginning portion that we've also spoken about before in relation to the the fifty days and then the Son of Man being here and so forth. Okay, so again, what is this talking about? It's in relation to Laodicea. It was the Laodicean age before Christ. It was the Laodicean age that we're in. And at the end, it's going to be the Laodicean age in the 14 years. Okay, in that second half of trumpets. So we're now in the Laodicean age. 
But what does it tell us about Laodicea right before all of this starts over again? Well, we're going to look into that. We're going to see what it is it talks about. But I wanted you guys to also remember that there are things like this that we know. The book of Ezekiel from chapter 33 to 48 gives us a prophetic picture. And you're going to even see him talking about it. Here's this conversation in chapter 40 about the temple that's going to start. And then all the details of the temple and the rebuilding of it. Hello. It's pretty awesome. And then we're going to see something in 47. And what do we know takes place in 48? When they all receive their lands, their portion of land. Well, when does that happen? In the final jubilee. Where is it connected to? Well, same with John chapter 21. It's the same with it's the same with the story of the ark. I mean, the story of Noah. It's the final year. So within the story of Noah, we've proven it many times over the years. Within the story of Ezekiel, we've proven it in our chapters to years. Within the story of John, we've proven it in our chapters to years. What are the chances that you think all three of these things have a connection to the timing of what 153 is talking about? It's so incredible. So let's have a listen. We're going to have a listen to this one here for a few minutes, and we're going to start to build on this understanding, these words that are being spoken, these studies that have been done over the centuries in relation to the 153 from John. Let's have a look. You say there are two cases at least of Gamatria. One is a 666, and the other is the reference to the miraculous catch of 153 fish, which is seen as an application of Gamatria, derived from the name of a spring called Eglion, which appears in Ezekiel 47.10. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from En Gedi, even unto En Eglayim. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. There are people who believe that this is a prophecy of the Dead Sea. And even, I would say, in the past 10 years, every so often a little news item will pop up that there are fish in the Dead Sea. Actually, what there are are freshwater pools forming around the Dead Sea. So see, you guys have probably all heard this. I know I've seen over the years posts and videos in the forum and saying, see, look, there's some fish in these in these ponds and pools in the Dead Sea. But it has nothing to do with now. We know that this is something directly related to the end of days. We know it. That's not going to be all filled and everything's going to be all joyful and fresh water in there yet. You still have to have the end of days play out. So we know this is already talking about future. See, and there are fish in them. Also, in Eglion is really two words, so it would be okay to just take the gematria of Eglion, which is 153. The appearance of this gematria in John 21. Now, see, this is a key thing. So that word for Eglion, let me show you. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 47. And, and this is just one portion of a video clip. I've got another one. They talk about how the word Eglion, so see with these in verse 10. So in Ezekiel 47, verse 10, it says, and it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon, uh, shall stand upon, uh, sorry, give me a second. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from uh, in Gedi, even unto in Glyam, they shall be uh, a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea exceeding many. Sounds very similar to John chapter 21, doesn't it? And the wording for this, has to do with fountain, but the, the, the gematria of it, you see, because this is what she was saying at the very beginning. The gematria, which is this count and these things that have been around for in BC times, that the connection in the New Testament, there's one for 666 and there's one for 153. And you're going to see that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, why is it important that it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Because they were the Essenes, the, the watchmen, that were the ones prepared, ready for Christ's coming. Following? So what, what was so important about it? Well, it was that the Gematria, which is why the Essenes knew that this connection, and uh, 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 when John came about, remember, because these guys continue on, right? They become Essenes, they become... Uh, the Nasserines and all of that, right? They're the watchmen even going forward into the is. And so what do we see? This word for Inglion is the one that's connected 
to um to 17 and 153. You're going to see what we're talking about. But what else do we know? Well, as we continue to go, you're going to realize that this connection to this chapter, which we know is the 14th year of tribulation, has this connection in it. Where am I here? Has this connection in it to, look at this, fountain of two calves. Seems strange, right? Well, look at what this one says. Bullock, okay? It has to do with a bullock. And look at what it means. To revolve, circular, round. This is what I'm telling you. It's this, it's this thing playing out within the seven churches, within the was, the is, and the is to come of time. And, and who do we know it relates to in the end of days? <laughs> the bullock. It's directly connected to the bullock. So, and you even see eye of the fountain. Where have we seen this when it comes to the eye of the fountain? Right? We've seen this in um, in Genesis chapter 29 with Jacob. When he first meets with her and then he, you know, the whole story then begins. You see, it's at the beginning, yet this is at the end. And the connection within it is 153 directly connected to the connection to this name, which is how they knew it in advance already, that this gematria within it was 153. And the story being spoken about is the exact same story in John chapter 21. So it's pointing to Ezekiel chapter 47. Look at what it says. Uh, John 21 verse 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the, to the land full of great fish, 153 in all. Okay, And the net wasn't broken. It's all about them having gone fishing catching all these manner of fish and great fish and many fish. So you have the same story and the connection in Ezekiel chapter 47 being where this story of 153 and the purpose of it being pointed to us back into Ezekiel. So right away, we can see for us, well, you're going to see more, that it's prophetically directed to the end look at let's look at the beginning of chapter 47 do you think this has happened yet chapter 47 verse 1 afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house and behold waters issued from under the threshold of the house eastward for the forefront of the house for the forefront of the house stood toward the east and the waters came down from under and from the right side of the house and at the south side of the altar. Then he brought me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without um about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward and behold there ran waters on the right side. So it's all about the waters, it's all about the Lord renewing the earth. The waters flowing out from the temple that will renew the earth. Do you think this is something that happened in the was? No. Something that happened in the is? No. This is until the end of the is to come. This is, this is when he comes and he's here on the 14th year. Feet down, destroys the enemy, replenishes the earth. You see, that's where I was saying... Where is it within that year? Well, sometimes things can be at the beginning, around the middle, towards the end. See, he's not going to replenish the earth if he hasn't destroyed the enemies yet. But what? where's it connected to? Okay, and they shall live. Listen to, listen to verse 9. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithsoever the river shall come, shall live shall revive, shall quicken. Huh. And there shall be very great multitude of fish because these, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed. We did a video on this a long time ago, do you remember? For they shall be healed. What is, what is this healing? It's this healing of the waters, this healing of the land. 
Everything's going to be repaired and replenished. Who are the fish? People? People? Isn't there a group of people that's going to be revived? Isn't there a group of people that something is going to change within them? So we've got this word healed, which means to repair. This is at the end of tribulation. And everything shall live whither the water cometh. And then you've got the story of the connection to 153. This is a big deal. If you remember this, if we go to Isaiah chapter 65, you'll remember this connection as well. This It's called the new heavens and the new earth, but it's not the new heavens and new earth yet, right? It's not the new earth. It says in verse 17, Isaiah 65, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth for the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But this isn't the actual new heaven, uh, new earth yet, right? Watch this. A new earth, a fresh thing. You ready? Remember what the other word was? When he heals, he repairs, right? So if it's connected to the 14th year, after the destruction of all the enemies, and then water is going to go up from the temple, and it's going to repair. Well, if we go to this word for new, and we follow to the root word of it, look at what we get. To be new causatively, to rebuild, repair. He wasn't saying that at this point it's going to be new heaven and new earth, new Jerusalem coming down. That's not what's happening. This is the end of tribulation, the end of the 14 years, when he's going to renew it. And all those things of old will no longer be remembered when he renews the earth. Do you remember what happens here in verse 20? Um, let's start in verse 19. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For a child shall die a hundred years old. You see? So somebody being even a hundred would be as if they were still a child. Why? Because it's going to go back as it was in the beginning. And people will live hundreds and hundreds of years again. We've done a study on this before, right? Which was connected to Ezekiel 47. The only thing I didn't know back then is that the 153 had a connection to it as well. And especially what else was connected to it. And so here she's now talking about in the Gematria of John 21 with 153, it had a connection within the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, listen to this. 11 has been connected to one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, namely 4Q252, which also applies the same Gematria of 153, derived from Ezekiel 47, to state that Noah arrived at Mount Ararat on the 153rd day after the beginning of the flood. In fact, it's very close. It says in Genesis 8.3, and the waters were turned off the earth continually, and after the end of 150 days, the waters were evaded. Now, there is some discussion as to whether there are 153 or 154 verses in Parsha Vayishlach. The stone squamash says 154, but there are 153 verses in Noah, in Parshat Noah, which consists of Genesis 6, 9 through 11.32, which is undoubtedly why the Dead Sea Scrolls people connected it back to that gematria of 153. So looking at the sequel. All right. So you see in that now, <clears throat> We're seeing that the 153, there's 153 verses for Noah's story within Scripture. So they made this connection within the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let me see. Within the Dead Sea Scrolls, they made this connection. But this connection went way beyond that because it also was a count, as I said, that had 153 and 7 in the gematria, see, this is what we were. This is what she had mentioned here a little bit ago, but she didn't go into the fact that the numbers were there. And it, this is what she was talking about when she said uh, "en Getty and "in Gallum." Okay, this is what she was talking about. So, what do we see? We see this connection from 153 from the Dead Sea Scrolls that was connected to uh, Ezekiel 47 because of the gematria of 153. And 17. 
Now, why does Gamacho of 153 and 17 make a difference? What is, what's that all about? Well, when we get into another video clip, now we still have a little bit more in hers, but you're going to see this story being played out. So what is the triangle of a number? Okay, so the triangle of 153 is 17, 17, 17. Okay, so it's 17. So you got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, and it has 17. So that's how you get to the triangle of a number. So what is the triangle of 153, 17? So you've got 50, 153 and 17. And this is, in understanding that, they were able to bring it to Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 10, because of the gematria of the numbers within these names that were there. That's what this is talking about. So let me see. Um, it says right here, uh, perhaps the best evidence relating to this is the chronology of the flood uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the water swelled on the earth for 150 days, Genesis 7, 24, until the 14th day of the seventh month, Genesis 8, 4a, um, on the third day of the week. And at the end of 150 days, the waters decreased for two days, the fourth day and fifth day, and on the sixth day, this is, you see, this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls 4Q252, where they're saying that the connection to it is actually also not only in Ezekiel 47, but it is also connected to the story of the flood from Noah. So it's the 153rd day, the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, and it was the seventh day of the seven, uh, in the seventh month. Hello. Isn't this something we also have already taught on and understood? That the final year, the 14th year of tribulation, is the story of Noah? It gives us the big overall picture, like I said at the beginning, but it also plays out as the final year of Noah. And we got... Dead Sea Scrolls that are connecting Ezekiel 47 to John 21 to the story of Noah. All being connected to 153. This is, this is huge for, for the revelation. We can fully understand the timing of 153. This is why I was showing you earlier. When the Lord returns feet down as he comes as lightning on the day and hour, no one knows, and it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. This is a direct reference to that final year. And in the midst of that final year, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, is the connection to 153. Exactly 100% where we've been teaching it for the last several years. Exactly where we've been teaching the understanding of Ezekiel chapter 47 at the renewal when the waters go out, directly connected to when the Lord returns after he's come feet down, then destroys the enemy at some point within this year. Well, what was it with the story of Noah? Within this final year is the connection to 153. You see, it wasn't saying it was at the beginning. It was talking about when the when the ark rested and so forth. So it's not at the beginning, it's somewhere in the midst, midish or so, of that year where this ends up playing out. Pretty amazing, right? Well, don't we know something about uh, Zechariah chapter 14 as well? Of it being the final year, the day of the Lord, the year, the, the year of his vengeance? We know that it's the same story of Noah's. And then what will take place afterwards, after he's replenished and renewed the earth. You'll see how all of this continues to tie, to tie together. It's all telling us this exact same timing in the final 14th year. <clears throat> now, in this one, I say, listen closely. Because what she says here is what really started to catch my attention. Now listen to this. Of Abraham. Another connection that people make 
which is immediately before Parshat Noah, is the term B'nei Elohim, which appears in Genesis 6, 2, and 4. And it has a gematria of 153. Some people have tried to attach this to the B'nei El Chai in Hosea when the people are restored, but it's a bit of a stretch. In general... Ha-ha! <laughs> Did you hear that? Some try to say that the connection to this, because let's go read Genesis chapter 6, 2 and 4. Watch this. Genesis chapter 6, 2 and 4. See? It's all about this conversation of the sons of God that came into the daughters of men. So what does she say? Well, these are not the good sons of God. These are the fallen ones. But not all of them are fallen. There were the sons of God who we are. And she's going to go on to continue to talk about that. And so what is she saying? There's a 153 connection to the B'nai Elohim, which have. has to do with the sons of God. The restoring of the sons of God. The restoration of the sons of God. Is it the restoration of these bad ones? No. It's the restoration of the ones that we know from the beginning of Genesis. You see, to us here in this ministry, this is a huge deal. It's directly connected to what our brother Mark Scuderi likes to say, the one oneers Those who were part of the spirit. This, this gap theory creation of Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Before the Son of Man in the picture of his 40 days comes to be light or was made light. This is the spirit creation for which the sons of God came from. But did they all fall? Were they all bad? No. So what's this connection that other scholars have come to to say that it's a connection to the sons of God being restored? The sons of God being restored? Does that sound familiar? Heck yeah, it does. Let's just keep going because you're going to see she's going to continue to talk about this connection to the sons of God because we all know in Genesis, uh, uh, in Romans and so forth, that we are now the sons of God. Those who are in Christ's spirit filled are the sons of God. And Genesis 1-1 is those who are what? There's the son, there's the father, and there's the spirit. All three of them in the first two verses. And who are the ones that have the Spirit of God? Well, you guys know, according to Romans chapter 8, the ones who have the Spirit of God are the sons of God. I tried to attach this to the B'nai El Chai in Hosea when the people are restored, but it's a bit of a stretch. In general, the B'nai Elohim at the beginning are clearly supernatural beings. They're not human beings. So we look at Genesis 6, 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Job 1, 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yehovah, and Satan came also among them. So clearly they're not human beings. Whether they are up to no good at this point, we don't know, uh, as they were in Genesis, up to no good. We see them in Job 38, 7. So from verse 4, God is trying to straighten Job out and say, where were you on the day that I created everything? So he says in verse 4, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Did you see this? Did you see this? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, the Beneha Elohim, supernatural beings that were created before the human being. The first shift we see in meaning is in Daniel 3.25, when the three Hebrew boys are in the furnace. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. And then we see that the son of God is Yeshua. In Mark's gospel 1.1, the beginning of the gospel of Yeshua the Messiah, the son of God. And finally, we see through our salvation process that Yeshua has given us the right to be called sons of God because we are a new spiritual creation. Romans 8. Okay, there. Now here she is going into Romans 8, 14, and 1 John 3, <clears throat> 1 and 2. So let's go to that wonderful piece of scripture in Romans chapter 8. And have we not already taught on this? Those who are what? In Christ. Those who are in Christ, spirit-filled. 
they are the sons of God. They are the sons of God. They're all the pre-tribbers. We've shown it through 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Those who go first are what? Those who are in Christ go as the Luke group pre-trib. They're the ones who are in Christ, spirit-filled, the sons of God. But there's a group within those sons of God who are remaining, as we've taught many times. Listen to this. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go. No, let's start in verse. Let's start in verse nine. But you are not of the flesh. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You see, those who are going pre-trip in Christ only. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up, listen to this. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead, listen to this, shall quicken your mortal bodies. Shall what? Shall quicken, shall revitalize, shall, shall bring back your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. Um, didn't we just show that? Wasn't, wasn't that just talked about in, in Ezekiel 47 with the waters? And the connection was to the waters and to 153 and was connected to Noah and everything connected to that final 14th year? When what happens in that final 14 year? The resurrection of the dead? There's only one group, well, two groups that have part in the resurrection of the dead. But Revelation is telling us about a specific group. Now, do we know that there are two groups in the resurrection of the dead? Yes, of course, there were all those that had the promise that haven't received it yet. And Daniel is a great example of it. What is he told in the very last verse of the book of Daniel? Uh, verse Chapter 12, verse 13. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot in the end of days, at the end of days. There it is again, end of days, end of days, at the time of the end, at the end of days. You see? The, the groups are those who were of the promise, the, the ancient Jews and so forth, and the Jews in history that had that promise but never received it. But there's another group. And this group that's going to have their bodies quickened is a group that's going to be resurrected to rule and reign with Christ. So who are they? Well, listen to this with the heirs of Christ. We know, again, everybody who is an heir of Christ is going pre-trip. Whether they've already passed and they're with them already or whether they're going pre-trib, never having tasted of death, but there's also a group from among them who are remaining. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the, what? By the Spirit of God. So as many as are led as that one oneers, that one oneers of Genesis group, what are they? They're the ones led by the Spirit of God, not the ones that fell, but the ones who are now what? The sons of God. So she's saying this, 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 uh, um, this resurrection, this revitalizing, this renewing of the sons of God. And she thinks it's a stretch. It doesn't quite make sense how 153 and the connection of the story is connected to this reviving of the sons of God. It sure makes sense to us. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's because this group will reign with them, right? If so be that we suffer with them, that we may also that we may be also glorified together. For what? Those who suffer with them. In the is of things, many people have suffered over the thousands of years, and they're going to be glorified with them. But there's also this revelation that we're talking about in relation to the is to come. 
And so what? This group is going to suffer persecution with them. They're going to put their necks on the line. But they're going to be glorified together as he was. How are they going to be glorified? The same spirit that's in them is going to quicken their bodies at the end. And what are they going to be? Joint heirs to do what? To rule and reign with Christ. Listen to what it says. Revelation chapter 20. You guys all know this one. Right? Those who were beheaded, not having taken the mark, the image, the name of the beast. And it said, um, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So this group here is part of the first resurrection. And everybody else who's died has to wait till after the thousand years are over. What do these people who take part in the first resurrection, what do they get? Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but he shall, uh, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. Is this everybody? No. It's the ones who are priests, those the servants. Who did we see they were? In the was, it went from Jews to the is. Then in the is, it turned to the time of the Gentiles. And it's a Gentile group being prepared in our watchmen for when the is to come starts. A group prepared beforehand. And what is he going to do with this group? He's going to sit and sup with them and have a meal with them even before it all begins. To let them know so that they're not freaking out. We know this from Luke chapter 12 and Luke 14. And who are the ones, for those who are new, those who are the ones that don't take part in the second death? It's in Revelation chapter 2. It's Smyrna. And lo and behold, as we know from the study of Polycarp and all that group, Polycarp was what? He was the, he was the bishop of Smyrna. And what was he called? You guessed it, a 14er. Okay, suffering persecution and so forth. Don't let anybody take your crown. And listen to what it says in verse 11, uh, Revelation 2, verse 11. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The only group that won't be hurt of the second death directly related to the remnant workers who are going to be part of the resurrection, who are connected to 153, in the midst of that final 14th year. You see what I'm saying? It's also connected to the sons of God and the resurrection of the sons of God. This, this, this is the kind of stuff, I mean, this hadn't been known. This wasn't stuff that was understood before. Let's go to 1 John 3. And watch this connection. First uh, John chapter 3. Watch this. Okay, let's start. Let's start in verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Because it knew not him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Hello. You want to understand the timing of this? this? This appearing that it's talking about? Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Well, we know who the sons of God are. We just saw it. We know that there's going to be a restoration of the true sons of God, not the fallen ones, but of the true sons of God who were his remnant workers, who will take persecution in the is to come, who will be resurrected in the final year to rule and reign with them you see so it does not yet appear what we shall be but when we but when he appears we will be like him 
and it's the Greek word 5319. Let's have a look at this word 5319. Here's the word 5319. Here it was in 1 John 3, 2, 3, 5. And look at the only two places where you see this word in the book of Revelation. This is why, guys, for anybody that's new, having a program like this, this one's called eSword. Okay, you can see it up here, eSword. I think it's a few dollars a, a year at most. Like, I mean, like a handful, less than 10 bucks a year or something like that. And free maybe on the device, depending which one you have. You can download all sorts of Bibles, but get the KJV Plus and you get all the word definitions. This is what is going to explode your understanding of Scripture within the Revelation. So when you do this, you can go and search the times when it's used. And where it's used and when it's used plays a really important part in all of this. And look at where it's playing a part on in the book of Revelation. It's in verse, it's in Revelation 3:18 and in 15:4. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. And where do we see it, guys? Laodicea. Remember, I said it starts in Laodicea and it ends in Laodicea, meaning, meaning at the right as the tribulation is right as it's about to start. We know, as we have taught. That the Lord is going to, in the is of the Laodicean age that we're in, right as it's about to come to an end, we know that the Lord is going to appear to this, or it's believed in the revelation on this part, I should say, that the Lord will appear to that remnant worker, sons of God. Those ones that we were reading about in 1 Peter, the ones that were just talked about in, in 1 John 3. The ones that we just saw in Romans chapter 8. He's going to meet with the Smyrna group at the very tail end, like I think within the last few hours of the Laodicean age before everything changes. He's called what? This is something for the end, but it's also something where he's called the true witness. Well, only Luke's group, which is that remnant group remaining, only Luke's remnant remaining group are the ones called his witnesses in Luke chapter 24. They're the ones who follow him for 40 days, and they're the workers that we're talking about who will put their necks on the line, who will die, not taking the mark, and they will be resurrected to rule and reign with them. They're the church of Smyrna. They're the only ones as a witness. So you've got a little typology because what? Christ is going to be one of the witnesses at the end. That's for another story if you're new. So he's called the true witness. Well, who is this group? This Smyrna group that he's meeting with before, right before the pre-trib happens and the seven churches start over again, he's meeting with the Smyrna group, that Luke group. And who are they? Well, if they're the sons of God and they're co-heirs with Christ, Christ is calling himself a true witness. And that's the only group in Luke 24 called his witnesses that he tells them are his witnesses. You see that you see one connection? Well, let me show you something else. Look at the word naked that we get. In Revelation 3.17, I know they're poor, miserable, and poor, blind, and naked. There's one piece of the word naked, one wording used, right? Verse 18 now. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried, by, tried in the fire. Didn't he? Just, we were just reading. I told you guys to remember that, right? That that group from First Peter is a group that is more precious than any gold tried in the fire. Because he's speaking to that same group. Because in the very tail end, right before the seven churches start over again in the 50 days, in the above portion, that the pre-trib happens, he is going to reveal himself. I don't know if it's himself. I don't know if it's, I mean, I would assume it's himself because we know from Luke chapter 12, those have been around for a little bit. We know from Luke chapter 12 that they're the ones he's telling them to be girded about and their lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. 
that when he returns and knocks, you may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom he shall find watching. What is he going to do? He's going to sit down to eat with them and serve them. So he's going to serve them and eat with them. And we've taught on this because we know this is only going to happen and only happened in Luke's uh, gospel in the resurrection story with those two that he ends up calling his witnesses. Craziness, right? But we're going to get into this naked part as well in a moment. Um, that thou mayest also be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed that the shame of thy nakedness doth not appear and anoint thine eyes with onslaught that thy may that they may see um that they may say oh yeah and then verse 20 behold i stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door i will come into him and will sup with him and he with me this is all connected to that same group but what is it here it's it's in the pre it, it's right before we know that according to Luke 12, he is going to meet with this group right before the pre-trip. He is letting them know before it happens, moments before it happens, I believe. Like that day, hours, moments, I have no idea. But right in that time frame, before the pre-trip, so that these people aren't freaking out, not realizing that they've been chosen to work for the Lord. And so he's forewarning them. And all of this is showing it. We know it's this connection to pre. And when he returns from the wedding, what's he going to do? He's going to sit with them and sup and eat with them. But what else does it say? Uh, verse 21, to him that overcometh, I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I am set down with my father in his throne. So you see a group that's going to sit with his throne. There was only one group told to sit in, that's going to sit with him in his throne. And they were the co-heirs who will reign and rule with them, who will be part of the resurrection when the water goes out, connected to the 153 in that timing, connected to the story of the ark in the final year. It's And, and what is this? This is pre. Right moments before in the pre. Not It's not the pre-trib, but it's after he meets with this moment, like Luke 12, telling them he's about to take them to the wedding. And when he returns to be ready, and then what is it also in the end, as in the end of tribulation in that 14th year, when it's the end in association to Laodicea after they've played out again in the is to come? They're going to sit with him in his throne. It's it's a replay. It's it's going through the whole thing. It's the end of one, the start of the others again. It's the end of one, the start of the others again, just as the original watchmen were. Well, let me show you something else, okay? We see this in Revelation um, uh, uh, 3.18. Let's go to Revelation 15.4. And in Revelation 15.4, listen to what it says. 15.4. Um, Who shall not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou own for thou only art holy for all nations shall come and worship before thee for thy judgments are there it is manifest you see that this the, the lord's here the lord's here you see and and what do we see it's the seven plagues about to go up because we know the seven plagues are connected to the final year of tribulation as we've taught but you're going to see there, there's a greater connection, another connection. I'm going to show you in Revelation 16 as well. But I want to show you this first. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. When do all nations come to worship before him? Remember I told you I would also show you Zechariah 14. <clears throat> directly connected to the ark year to John 21. To Ezekiel 47, well, it's also Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, I think verse 16, and what does it say? After what? The judgment of those plagues, you see, which relates to the bowls 
And look at what happens. Verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What did it say? All nations will come up to worship him year after year after year. Where is that directly connected to? Well, we're at the bulls. We're at the bulls, and at the time where they were made manifest, where, where all of his judgment was made manifest, and now all nations are going to come and worship before him because his judgments were made manifest. Again, the final 14th year, which is precisely in that latter time frame of the 14th year where we put that that those seven bowls. That's why we don't talk about them too much. There are things that are going to last a very short period of time. The bowls will not last years. They're going to probably be days. You know, they're so violent, they're not going to last very long. But it's got to take place in that final year. And before what? Well, it's got to be before the Ezekiel 47, when water will go out to renew and to replenish the whole earth, to repair it. Which means the bulls are a little bit later, or mid-ish later, right? And then what? Then he will replenish everything, and people will live. They will live longer. There'll be the resurrection of only those uh, of those who were given the promise and those who were to rule and reign, who were servants, as the um, Smyrna group, as the Luke 24 group, as those that he foremet with. It's all pointing to the same time. It is the, the what did they, what did she call them? Oh, wait, it just reset. I'm going to make a bold statement. Right, so what it, what was this all about? It was about, sorry, it's getting hot in here. It was about when the sons of God would be revived. All of it is connected to that final 14th year. Over and over and over again. Let me show you now something within John 21. It's really interesting, okay? For the, the relation to the timing. In John 21, starting in verse 6, And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw for the multitude of fishes. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, listen to this, he girt his fisher's coat on, for he was naked. Strange, right? Did you guys ever wonder why was why was this put in for he was naked like what on earth was he doing naked on the boat with his buddies while they were fishing at night <laughs> i don't know what the culture was back then you know it was like locker room i guess you know just hey uh you know it's just warm out tonight dude i'm you know don't mind me but what does the lord say don't be found naked. So he's told by John or the disciple who Jesus loved. And so he's like, oh, throws on his fisher's coat and then jumps on the water to go see the Lord. And then you find out that it's the 153 fish. The word naked is there. Remember how I said it's the end, but it's also the beginning? Because from the resurrection, it goes to this happening. So you have it from the was going into the is. And then you have the is to come, right? Or the, the, the is going into the is to come. Well, what did we just see was connected in relation to that is then moving into the is to come? Well, we have Laodicea. Remember what it said about Laodicea? That they were blind and naked. What does he say about the workers? Oh, don't, you know, I counsel thee to buy... Uh, uh, to buy of me gold tried by fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So we see it as the 
as the um uh, the the is if you will this is before the is to come because that's what it was with john before the holy ghost came okay when john or the one who jesus loved was telling um peter so we see this connection what is it the connection to it it was the end so it was it was the church age in this typology that i was showing you from the from the was in the typology of these things that played out in the Old Testament. And you could even take it right to when Christ was here before the apostolic portion just started, which was when the Holy Ghost came. Right in that portion of Christ for 40 days and in and, and the time of the Holy Ghost, all in that time frame from his resurrection. And, and how does it start? It starts with Laodicea. So at the resurrection of Christ is still in the was, like this portion even really. It was still in the was because he was still a reflection of Laodicea in his nakedness. And so how fitting that this is also a picture of those buying gold refined in the fire and tried in the fire that he's standing on the door and when he knocks there to open to him so that they could sup with him and him with them and that it's the group when it's all over that's going to sit with him in his throne who are going to rule and reign with him. It's this group that he's going to meet with as he did with them after the resurrection, which is when he comes to meet and dines and sups with this group, which means when he tells them this is about to happen, we know it's the tail end of the Laodicean age. It's coming to the end of the Laodicean age. Just as, just as Peter was giving us a picture of the end of the Laodicean age by himself being naked when the Lord showed up. What is it revealed to us in the prophetic is to come? Well, it's the whole thing I was telling you about. It was that it was that circle that as the very beginning of the end of day starts, it's connected to the very last moments of Laodicea. And that even us as watchmen had better be prepared, watching, not being caught naked, like John, like Peter was. Okay? Now, did he get busted? No, because John told him, and so he girded himself right away. What do you think is going to happen when the Lord, at his coming, when we're expecting him, when we're watching this time frame, and it's the Lord that appears, or the angels, or the angel of the Lord, whoever he sends, to say, when I return from the wedding, be ready. That moment will be the end of the Laodicean age. They will know that when he returns and he's at the door, they will knock. And this group will know, at least if they're a part of this ministry, that they're a part of those who will sit down at his table. That will be part of those ruling and reigning with them when they get to be part of the resurrection. First resurrection, where the second death will have no, will have no effect on them. It's connected to the end. But it's also the beginning, just as it was from his death and resurrection, from Laodicea to the restart, because what happened then with the apostles? It was then the beginning of, as we know, Ephesus in the apostolic age. There's your picture of when he comes back and it's the 40 days, which really played out, you know, further into it in the is. But it started, even while Christ was here, it was an apostolic age time. I mean, a, um, a Laodicea church time. The apostolic age didn't, trust, didn't start until after Christ, not before Christ. Not even while he was here. It was like this preparation. Let me show you. In relation to the, the is to come, Watch this. Naked, 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 naked. 
all the references of naked and you clothed me or naked and you didn't clothe me. When were you naked? All of it is found in Matthew chapter 25. The references in Mark in the Synoptic Gospels has nothing to do with um, with the same context. It was that it was that young man that ran. Right. He, he his loincloth fell off and, and he was he cast about and he went running. OK, it's not the same context there. This is the context of what we're talking about. And where is Matthew 25, brothers and sisters? The only other place it's found where John stands on his own, which is John chapter 21. John chapter 21 and Matthew 25 are the exact same time frame. They're that that final year right towards the tail end of that year when the Lord will return and the wedding will take place. And what does he tell them? At the end of the 14 years now, he says what? He says, I was naked. You didn't clothe me. I was this, you know, all these representations of him and you didn't do it. And what happens to this group in Matthew 25? They're cast out to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Which means this period of time was connected until John 21, which was the final 14th year. You following what I'm saying? That when this time comes to an end, right here, the final 14th year, when it comes to the end, and he's talking about naked, and I was naked, he didn't clothe, we see the connection to Peter, and he was naked and threw on a jacket. He's now talking in this reference in Matthew 25, right at the end of this 14th year, and they didn't recognize it. They don't get to be part of the wedding. They don't get what? Do you remember what happens? They're going to get what? White garments, right? Where did it say that? Do, 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 do. And white garments. Who are those who end up getting white garments at the end of tribulation? At the end of the 14 years. Those who are going to the Jewish wedding. Remember, there's a pre-trib Gentile wedding, but at the end of 14 years is the Jewish wedding. Who gets to go in? Those who are given raiments, the, the white clothing to join the wedding. And what happens to those in Matthew 25? At the end of the 14, he tells them, I was naked, I was this. And you didn't, you didn't help. And they get cast out into the darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth while everybody else is going into the wedding. Look at where it's connected. Look at where it goes into Genesis. I mean, into the book of Revelation. Okay. In Revelation 3.17, okay, well, we just saw that. In Revelation 3.17, so we know again the connection is to the end now. So we were showing how it was connected to right near the very beginning when it all started, and it would be the end of the Laodicean age and the start of the is to, uh, the is to come. And then at the end of the is to come, the end of the 14 years, we know it's the end of the 14, and what do we see? The word naked, that is also connected to the end because John's gospel was the start of the is, but it's also a prophetic typology throughout the 21 chapters of the is to come. And so those who are refined, those who were his, those who were supping with them and, and knocked, and when he knocked, they opened. They're going to be the ones resurrected to sit with him in his throne. And he's, and he's telling those <clears throat> who when he was naked and so forth, and they never clothed them, he's telling them this at the exact same represented time of Revelation chapter 3, 17, at the end of the is to come, Laodicea. You following what I'm saying? Just rewind, pause, slow it down. And all of this has an association and connection to the 153 and the timing of what John's talking about in chapter 21. Well, let's look at where else we find it. In Revelation 16, verse 15. Remember when I told you near the beginning, this is going to give little clues to, to mystery Babylon and when it's destroyed? Well, let's have a look at this. Uh, verse 15. What do we see happening here? Well, remember we went from 15, where it was also talking about this nakedness, 
And what happened? The seven bowls were about to be poured out. Relating to that final 14th year picture. And here we are now where the bowls are being poured out. And look at what we get in verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Actually, we can even start here in verse 14 or even 13. Remember? The only way you can have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet is, of course, if there are three spirits and three beings. And this has to be before they're all uh, uh, before they're killed. So that means the dragon isn't yet put in chains and the beast and the false prophet haven't been cast into the lake of fire. We know that happens after these judgments, which will be right towards like in that maybe in the midst midish type of, of the 14th year. Towards the midish end, because then he's got to renew the earth, right? I don't know how long that's going to take the Lord to renew the earth and the waters going out to bring back the, the reviving, to, to bring those back to life. I don't know. Is this snap of a finger and everything changes? But the only way you can have the beast and the false prophet here, it means that it's just before they were thrown in alive to the lake of fire. And we know that that happens in the final year because then the millennial reign comes. Uh, verse uh, Revelation 16, 14, for they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world uh, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Right. This is this is uh, Revelation 19, the 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 treading of the grapes battle. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed to see that watches and keep his, his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. There it is again. And what do we see happening here? Babylon. That great city, Babylon. The cup of the wine given to her. Which means Babylon the great. There's going to be a lot more detail, but clearly, mystery Babylon is here till the end of tribulation. But here's what we see again. So we've got that word naked again. Every single connection to this is all about the final 14th year, but it is also a prophetic picture of how it all begins going from the very end of Laodicea to, be, to when the seven churches will start over again. Because it goes from the end of Laodicea, right at the end of Laodicea. So this was the was, this is the is, this is the is to come. Right at the end of Laodicea, he's going to meet with this Smyrna group to let them know in advance. Right at the line before it happens. And then what happens on this line before it all starts? The pre-trip. The pre-trip happens. And the apostles will be anointed with the Holy Ghost immediately and represent the first seven days. And we've gone through all these. When he returns after the wedding, like he told him in Luke chapter 12, it's the Smyrna time starting. And these are the two groups working during the time of seals. This is the apostle group. This is the servants who are with him for 40 and then remain and are persecuted or are necks on the line and everything else. Every part of this relates to the 153 look at this in chapter tw in chapter 25 naked 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 look at this in verse 41 of matthew 25 then shall he say unto them on the left depart from me you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels so you see when this woman in that other video was saying well the sons of god i know that we are the sons of God now, but it, it's not a it's not a, a reviving of the the sons of God. You know that that's a bit far fetched. She believed because these guys are prepared for everlasting fire. But there's another group of the sons of God who aren't prepared for everlasting fire, but are prepared to rule and reign with Him, and they are the sons of God who will be resurrected in that final 14th, 21st big picture year 
connected to John 21 when the waters go out to replenish the earth. It's connected to the final year and the replenishing of the sons of God. It's awesome. Some of this crazy stuff, I hadn't seen any of this before. You see, this also leads us into 1 Corinthians 15. You know, so many people, because in prophecy, they see anything that, that resembles a, a body changing or, or a taking because they only see in Matthew's eyes, because they've all raised up and, and learned in hundreds of years of generation after generation, is learned from the Gospel of Matthew, because they don't understand Mark and Luke, they don't understand <laughs> where all these portions are, and so they cram it all in to all being a pre or all being a mid. This is all post. Look at what it says in verse 42 of 1 Corinthians 15. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Who's part of the resurrection of the dead? You see, the same group we've been talking about. First time in spirit. Da, 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 let's see where it is right here. Was born the earthly. Uh, now I say, Pashan Bhakti cannot bear the kingdom of God. Right here. So starting in verse 51, everybody loves this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. I don't understand why this is so difficult. It says it's the last trump, meaning the last trumpet. You know, some people, maybe there's some typology to one of Trump's kids or some, or Trump. I have no idea. But what it is definitely prophetically telling us is it's the last trumpet. So what is the last trumpet? It's the seventh trumpet. When the Lord has returned and, and he'll be known, it'll be, the, it, everything will be finished. He'll be seen coming from one end unto the other. And it will begin the final years, the days of Noah. And so what happens when the last trumpet? So then it says, for the trumpet shall sound, and listen to this, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Who are the ones that are going to be raised? You see? And then those who are remaining will be changed in that moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It's at the last trump. And you see, let me prove it to you. <clears throat> I touched on this a uh, little while back, and I, I mentioned it just recently, but it's one of those fantastic differences within the Gospels. And there's, man, there's so many. Like that three-hour video I have in that intro on the website, when you go to the one that goes like three hours of these differences within the Gospels, and that's not even all of them, not even close. But let me show you one of these. When Christ was crucified, we see in Luke's gospel and Mark's gospel, there is no mention of a group of people being resurrected from the dead. None. Zero. Only in Matthew's. And people would say, well, they were just giving different points of view and so forth. Yes, fine. Of course they were. But the reason it's not in Luke or in Mark and the Synoptic Gospels is because of the prophetic implication of why it's in Matthew when you realize that the end of days, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the last will be first and the first will be last. It goes Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You'll understand why Matthew chapter 27 and his resurrection is telling us that the rocks were rent. See? And the earth did quake. And the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many of the dead bodies of the saints. Listen to this. All of the dead bodies of the saints? Nope. Many dead bodies of the saints, which slept, arose, and came out of their graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared to many. This happened, obviously. But the reason for its happening in Matthew is because of the prophetic implication of the 
prophetic picture of the resurrection story in Matthew. And if you remember on the website when I was showing you this, that the, uh, where was it? Right here. That there's a pre, mid, and post typology in the triumphal entry of Luke, the triumphal entry, uh, uh, the, the transfiguration of Luke and the resurrection of Luke all give a prophetic picture of pre. The triumphal entry, transfiguration, resurrection in Mark give a prophetic picture of mid. Now, this is the of Christ coming. Okay? It doesn't mean the mid-trib happens right away. It's of Christ coming at mid-trib, which is at the end of the first six years. But we know the mid-trib great multitude doesn't happen immediately. And then you have the post. And the post in the triumphal entry, transfiguration, resurrection stories give us a prophetic picture of the Lord returning at the end of the 13th year for which he then is the days of Noah. So what are we seeing in this story? We're seeing the prophetic picture of his resurrection and then the graves will be open of many of the saints that arose. Who is all of this speaking about in relation to the end of days? Well, we know the, the Daniels and those of the promise. And we know those who were told that they would not be hurt by the second death, which had part in the first resurrection. Those who have part in the first resurrection are the ones who put their necks on the line as the worker group who were the watchmen prior to Christ coming, who were called 14ers, who were a portion of those in Smyrna, who were prepared for his coming, who were, who were watching and knowing that he's going to come and let them know when he knocks, when he returns. Every single part and portion is directly related to the Nazarenes who were a sect of people from Nazareth or watchmen who were the originals being called 14ers. It's crazy, guys. It's wild, wild, wild revelation. Let me play this video now. Listen to some of what this guy has to say. And then we'll finish it up. But triangular numbers came out. And then we're going to connect that. We're going to connect these triangular numbers back to Ezekiel 47. And we, we did that last week as well. We'll do it again today. So this 153 is not random. It has to do with triangular numbers, and it has to do with Ezekiel 4710. And so John includes it because it's part of the overall message of what he's saying is going on here. And we covered the, the triangular already. Okay, so preview. We're going to talk a little bit today about John and Ezekiel. Just John relies heavily on Ezekiel, both in the Gospel of John and in the Revelation. Especially in Ezekiel 40 to 47 is the new temple. It's the New Jerusalem, and it's the River of Life. So if you go to Revelation. <laughs> See, right off the bat, what is it? It's the new temple, right? The new revelation, the the the, the renewing of, of the waters. Well, that's, that's exactly what we show, right? The Lord has returned. They're preparing, and they're going to be rebuilding the third temple, just like the chapters to years. In 22, you get the River of Life, and he's relying on Ezekiel there, that vision, uh, as John is describing it as well. We're going to talk about the Hebrew alphabet. We would say alphabet. Alpha is Greek, of course. Hebrew, it's aleph bet because the first two letters of the of the, the first two letters in Hebrew are aleph and bet. So it's the alphabet. We say alphabet, but that's because alpha is Greek. We'll talk en gedi and en aglime. Now I just mentioned en means spring, so it's the spring of gedi and the spring of aglime. And what we want to do is say, how do we take that Hebrew alphabet and come up with numbers? And we'll use gedi and aglime. And this is what we were talking about earlier, right? In relation to one fifty three and seventeen, because that's just to demonstrate how that adds up to the numbers that we uh, will mention. We're going to add one piece. There's also something in the Hebrew Bible, a phrase that equals 153. And it's the phrase that translates sons of God. See that? That's what we were talking about earlier, right? In uh, Revelation 6, sons of God related to 153. And, and to, to hammer this point home, this is what I'm trying to say when, I, when I'm pointing to this and talking about how there's a group who who is going to, who are the sons of God, like we read, who are a part of the sons of God who are going to be chosen to remain. And he's going to meet with them 
right on this line, essentially, as Laodicea ends, he's going to meet with them, as we read in Luke chapter 12. Then the pre-trib will happen. He will go to the wedding, and when he returns, he will knock. And when he knocks, they will answer, and he will take them, and they will sup with them, and he will serve them and dine with them. This is only Luke's group. So you see, it's, it's this portion right here. And who are they? They're the sons of God. The co-heirs with Christ. So when it's all over and the end of days seven churches play out, who does it end with in Laodicea? The resurrection of the sons of God. It's the exact, it's the story, just recycling it. The 153 equals sons of God and the restoration of the sons of God when the water of Ezekiel 47 of the Lord having reestablished it goes out into all the earth when all the nations will come and worship before the Lord every year at Tabernacles. Hello. Are you seeing it? Of course it's related to the sons of God. It's the resurrection, the reviving, the renewal of the sons of God who were given the promise. And to think that there were those who had understood it, but not in the revelation, but just that the number was connected to the sons of God. Beni ha Elohim. And so we'll talk, we'll talk about sons of God because there's a scholar named Richard Bockham from Cambridge, and he suggests that what John is doing is pointing to the sons of God as part of that 153 interpretation. And then we'll finish today with just what's the overall message of 153 fish besides just it's a large catch of fish. All right, so that's our preview. So last week, we were in John 21. That's uh, post-resurrection. Disciples go fishing. They're fishing at night. Of course, the disciples never catch anything without the help of Jesus. And Jesus says, see, sees them early in the morning, says, did you catch anything? Nope, we didn't catch anything. Okay, throw the net over there. They throw it over there and they pull in a haul of fish. So John 21, 11 then reads something like this. So Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. So right there, that's the, we asked the question, why include that detail? The moment you see that detail, you say, you have to stop and, and ask that because John has, God gives the authors of scripture editorial control to tell their message. And it's an inspired message, no doubt, but it's not dictated. So you get the personality of Luke coming out in Luke and you get the personality of Matthew coming out in Matthew because they're contributing, it's a partnership. So I like to say it's inspired, not dictated. If it were dictated, then each letter would, have, would basically sound exactly the same as the Holy Spirit is speaking, but it's inspired. It's, they're inspired to give the message, but they do it in their own creative way. So when John includes a detail like that, you ask, why is John doing that? And of course, there's lots of answers. Should we be able to study deep enough? Okay, there were so many fish, 153 fish, but the net wasn't even torn. I mentioned last week that part of the miracle that was happening was wrong net, wrong fish, and too many fish for that net. So there's, we have to know a at least a little bit about first century fishing in order to understand some of the significance of each verse. Okay. So what's up with 153? Well, last week we mentioned that this is not just a random number. This is called a triangular number. And triangular numbers, um, they, they date far back, uh, even, even further back than Pythagoras, which is the 6th century BC. But it's a number sequence. And it's a number sequence that you can demonstrate mathematically or you can show graphically with an equilateral triangle. If you build an equilateral triangle then, and you want each side to be equal, then how many units end up total inside that triangle? And that's where you get triangular number. And last week uh, we mentioned that if you said, okay, what about the number four? What's the triangle of four? Well, you can do the math. Four plus three is seven, plus two is nine, plus one is 10. So you would say, aha, 10 is the triangle of four. Now that's just if you put it abstractly in an equation, but if you put it more concretely in a picture, it looks something like this. In five years, I'll be doing this full time. I'll be majoring in biomechanics. So again, you'd say, all right, we got number four and the triangle of that is 10, meaning if I create a triangle with four e or three equal sides, then you get 10 units on the inside of that triangle. That's where we get the name triangular number. Then if you said, okay, what's the triangle? What if we took this equilateral triangle and made it equal on each side, but it had 17 on each side? Well, the number would be 153. So 153 is the triangle of 17. Again, I'm just throwing numbers at you, but we can see this, this 153 then is connected to 17. And when we get back to the Ezekiel text, that's exactly what we're gonna find. That 153 and 17 are connected in that sentence. So that would stand out to an ancient person who would know something about triangle numbers or pay attention to them more than we do today. Like the Essenes. So if I go back and say, well, if, what if we showed this mathematically with 17? Then you have the number 17, right? And then you start adding up backwards. 17 plus 16 plus 15 plus 14 plus 13, down, 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 plus 1 equals 153. So that's how you can mathematically go through each number to find out what its triangle is. Or you can draw an equilateral triangle and just do it yourself. Okay, that was triangular number. So when we go back to John, as we did last week, then that number now leaps out at you because you know something about triangle numbers and you say, aha, 
That's not random. There's something about that number, but also because we're uh, the Jews would memorize as best they can their scripture. And so then you do math with your letters, which we'll talk about in a minute. And now you say, aha, I know where he's pointing to because there's something in Ezekiel that's going to reference 153. All right, this is still revealed last week, so I'm going kind of fast. We then said, where's the reference? Well, it's Ezekiel 47, and this becomes a critical chapter to John. Ezekiel 47 says, okay, I see that there's God showing me a new Jerusalem. There's a new temple. We're going to celebrate holidays. He mentions Passover and the Festival of Tabernacles. That's what John mentions too in his gospel, Passover and Tabernacles. And it's at the Festival of Tabernacles that he, he's going to make a reference back to Ezekiel 47 that Jesus is. There's a river of life that's going to come out of the temple, and it's going to fill up the whole world with fresh water. That's what you Okay. So again, just reconfirming what we were talking about when we were showing this. So when we, as I bring this to an end here, and we come back into where are you, Ezekiel 47, we know that this is all 100% prophetic. So as much as John chapter 21 was a picture of how it started as, as the is was starting after the death and resurrection of Christ, the where it was pointing to was also a prophetic picture of the is to come and when it's all over pointing to when he will renew the earth this is this is this is exactly what this whole story is about it seems like it's about you know the well it is about the 153 but the entire story and what it points to and what it tells us about is all about how it was the period of the end of the was moving into the time of the is as being Laodicea moving into the apostolic age and yet at the same time giving us a prophetic foreshadow, a prophetic insight that he's referring to him in this was moving into the is by referencing this 153 and bringing this about He's showing us that in the end, when it comes to the end of the is to come and it's all over, it will now be the end of Laodicea again, and he will bring about the restitution. He will bring about the renewing, the healing, the repairing of all things, and the making alive, right? Bringing back those who he will quicken as the sons of God. So what did we have? We also have it as an is going into is to come, which will begin with the sons of God, who are those that are spirit filled, who were chosen to remain, who he will pre-tell in advance just before it happens. And the seven churches start all over again. And when it's all over, John didn't only start it from 20 into 21. He will end it in 20 to 21, just as we've taught throughout this whole thing that that the picture of John chapter 20 is this picture of the of the beginning of the 50 days. So we already know, and we've been teaching for years, that it's a prophetic picture of the pre-trib, beginning of 50 days, then the eighth day, <clears throat> then him meeting with the Luke group, and then the 14 years beginning starting in Acts chapter 2, and then the story plays out, and then it's Luke's discourse, uh, Mark's discourse and Matthew's discourse. So we've already known this, but now we can prove it from another angle and everything that that scholars and ancient scholars and, and ancient writers have talked about have shown that this connection with Ezekiel and its meaning, modern scholars and those from Essene that that did the uh, um the the scrolls were also pointing that in the 153 points back to these ancient writings and these calculations in Ezekiel 47 which were directly connected to account that they discovered within the story of the Ark, which relates to the final year, which is also connected to the sons of God and the renewing of the sons of God, who are those who will be brought back to life with the healing that will take place when the Lord comes and renews with the healing waters. And every single part of this is directly connected to the 14th year when the Lord is returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. One portion, two portions, three portions, Matthew's gospel, Matthew's discourse, the, 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 the church of Laodicea, and the story of the ark in the final 14th year. Every single part and piece is directly correlated 
and lined up to John chapter 21 and the 153 with the replenishing of the earth and the destruction of the enemies, the, the being naked at that time and being ready for the Lord when he returns. And what happens? It's the restoration of the sons of God who were part of the sons of God ready in the is that when the is to come started, they will have their place. He will sup with them and dine with them. And when it's all over, they will take part in the resurrection, just as the reference of the 153 to the sons of God. Brothers and sisters, I hope you can follow that. If, if it was tricky, just rewind. Take your time. Follow it through. This isn't one for new people. Um, like I said, you want to spend time in the intro series first. This was an in-depth one. This was, you really had to be following at least for a little while to be able to understand and to track what it means chapters to years. What, what is this revelation within the Gospels and their differences to understand why that was so important in Matthew? Why, why is John and, and the chapter count and Zechariah and the chapter count and Ezekiel and the chapter count? W what is this all about? Is it just all fantasy? Where, what is this made up from? It's through the revelation that starts with the differences in the discourse uh, of the Gospels and the revelation of the true end of days timing. All of these things stem from those revelations that began the entire story. It seems crazy. Your, your thought process, if you're new, is, is, is in, in misunderstanding. And it has to be rewired to be able to see with end time eyes, to be able to receive it and to understand it. And I promise you, when you do, like everybody else, thousands and thousands of people around the world, that when they saw it, said, oh, my goodness. Now it's making sense. This was on the far end, like the deep end of Revelation. But now you can see that its direct correlation is the end. Because the true story of Noah is Matthew 24 after he's returned. It's the 14th year. The true story of the 153 is Ezekiel 47, which is directly correlated to the same final 14th year. It never skipped a beat. Every single one of them pointed to the final year. But being the final year in Laodicea and us still being in Laodicea, we can still see how that connection is from the very end of Laodicea to when the seven churches start over again. And then all of this is the culmination at the end of 14 years, at the end of Laodicea, just as it was going from the was and then Christ returning and meeting with them, being the end of Laodicea and the new age starting, which was to the Gentiles. And who was this remnant group who is remaining, who the Lord has chosen? It was the strangers, the remnant group, watching and praying. It's awesome. I mean, we knew depth was coming, guys. We knew greater and greater depth of revelation was going to continue. And now we can put a check beside the 153 and the revelation of them in their final year resurrection as the sons of God who will take part in the ruling and reigning with Christ. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray that you take the time to dissect it, to, to dig into it, to, to really understand it. And if you can, please help support the ministry. It, it, it's a real need right now. And get ready for the next video because in the next one, we are, I believe, hopefully it'll be the next one. Um, but the next one I am preparing for is the revelation going into this this uh, um, the, the mystery Babylon and this timing and what it reveals from what we've already revealed in relation to the beast. And maybe we can grow in understanding more of the ten horns and lay all the rest of this timing out for the end of days. It's wild. We can see it. We can now understand it better than we ever have in history. It's opening like it never has before. But this is not for the faint of heart. This goes depth. It goes details. And so if you're new, please, please either go to the website or 
come to this playlist and study those first four videos in the Revelation so that the rest will begin to make sense to you. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. Happy Thanksgiving to our American brothers and sisters, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.